it's two o'clock and so we are going to get started if that's okay with everyone um we are encouraging everyone to put their name and organization in the chat and so i just want to say good afternoon to everyone and happy bike month and thank you so much for joining us today and since we've got so much to cover i think it's time we get started um i am going to be your moderator today i'm brandy beaker the transportation demand management coordinator for orange county and through my program, Orange County Commuter Options, I promote the environmental, the physical, the economic, and even the emotional benefits mm -hmm. of driving alone. Um, I help connect people who live and work in Hillsborough to transportation resources that can improve their lives. Um, as I mentioned, I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. And if you came to get a better understanding of how to find the right bike for you based on your interests, your abilities, and your budget, then you clicked on the right link. We're so glad that you're here. and. We are going to be hearing today from cycling advocates from across our community on those considerations. And we're also going to talk about safety gear and organizations that you can connect with to help you with your ride. Before we hear from our presenters today, I just want to do a little bit and just talk a little bit about why we're hosting this webinar. As I mentioned, I'm my name's Brandy and my program is based in Hillsboro, but I'm part of a team of transportation management professionals that represent municipalities and organizations from across the triangle. We work in partnership to promote Go Triangle's employer services with the goal of reducing the number of single occupancy vehicles on our region's roads. Um, there's a link in the chat that you can check out to see more about that. But basically, we support over 160 employers throughout the Triangle and represent over 150,000 Triangle commuters and provide services that include free consultations to employers and property managers, both public and private. We provide guidance in creating commuter programming that retains and attracts top talent. And as I said, our goal is to reduce the number of people driving alone. And we do that ultimately by connecting people and places through reliable, easy to use travel choices that increase mobility, accessibility, and prosperity for our region. Um, like I said, there's a link in the chat and we encourage you to check that out to see how we can help you. Since cycling is one of the smart commute options that we promote year round, and since May is National Bike Month, we wanted to offer this webinar to help others experience the benefits firsthand. So um, you know the drill, we've got to start with a little bit of light, light housekeeping before we get to the good stuff. So today's session is being recorded and we understand if you'd rather not, but we'd love to see your faces. And so we encourage you to turn your cameras on, particularly during the question and answer session that we'll have after our presenters um, give their talks. Um, participants are muted and we ask that you um, post questions in the chat and we'll go through them during the Q&A. So again, if you're just getting here, we'd like you to put your name and organization in the chat. And now I'm going to introduce our speakers. We've got Tyler Dewey. Tyler has worked as Duke University's alternative transportation lead since 2019. In that role, Tyler promotes biking, walking, carpool, vanpool, transit, and more in an effort to reduce commute-related emissions. He is a certified League of American Bicyclist Cycling Instructor. And before Duke, joining Duke, Tyler was the Executive Director of Bike Athens, a mobility advocacy organization and nonprofit bike shop. Following Tyre, Tyler, we'll have a presentation from Heidi Perov Perry. She is a longtime bicycling advocate from Carborough, and Heidi is a founding member of the Carborough Bicycling Co Coalition, Bike Carborough. As a board member of Bike Walk NC, she has helped put on several statewide bike walk transportation summits and has participated in the North Carolina delegation that lobbies once a year on Capitol Hill. She's been engaged in Bike Walk NC's safety advocacy efforts, such as getting House Bill 232 passed, and that raised fines for injuries to vulnerable road users and allows the legal passing of bicyclists in no passing zones. Heidi also participates in ongoing education program development work with NCDOT. And our last presenter will be Mary Sell. Well, not last, not certainly not least. Mary Sell joined Oaks and Spokes in 2021 as their first staff member and interim director. Mary has lived in Raleigh almost six years and has engaged with the biking community from day one of calling Raleigh home. She has served on the Raleigh Bicycle and Pedestrian Commission and has volunteered time with Oaks and Spokes to help accelerate a more people-oriented transportation model for Raleigh during that time. Mary is regularly biking around Raleigh with her two kids in tow on their cargo bike. So look for her in the bike lane and say hi. All right, and with that, we're ready to begin. Tyler, are you ready to talk about types of bikes? Absolutely. All right. Hello, and thank you, Brandy, for the introduction. Thank you to Go Triangle for the invite. I'm excited to be such a part of such a great panel. 
Heidi and Mary have some great presentations lined up. I'm going to get us started by giving a very brief, very big picture overview of the different types of bikes out there. Which style works best for you will depend on what type of riding you like to use. If you have specific questions, we can follow up in the Q&A section later. So let's begin. So bikes are kind of like ice cream. Certainly there are at least 31 flavors. There are tons of varieties and options and ways to craft a bike that works just right for every person. Like ice cream, there are also some basic building blocks that we can start with before we get to all the fancy flavors and toppings. So we'll start with the basics, your vanilla, your chocolate, your strawberry, which are like the road, mountain, and hybrid bikes. You can go to the next slide. This is your classic road bike. Generally, they are built for light weight and speed. They are designed to go fast. They'll have skinnier tires, they'll have those curvy drop handlebars, and they have bigger gears to help you go fast and ride in the group. Generally, the bars will be lower than the saddle, so you'll be in a more aerodynamic position. Newer models increasingly will have disc brakes like a car or a motorcycle, like you see on many mountain bikes. These are great for exercise, riding on paved roads, or riding with groups or on charity rides. Next slide. The mountain bike is built for off-road adventures. This one pictured has a front suspension fork or suspension shock. Most, but not all new mountain bikes will have a front shock. Some will have rear shocks too. They have wider tires with knobs for traction in the dirt. Generally, they have a more upright position, so you're sitting a little taller, a little straighter, and the bars are closer to the height of the saddle. And generally, you have more room between the saddle and the top two. It make it easier for a quick dismount if you're riding off-road. They have gearing that makes it easy to climb steep hills. They have the flat handlebars. They're great for off-road trails, but depending on the setup, they can also be really nice for paved or gravel trails or even commuting. Next slide. The city hybrid bike is a mix between the road and the mountain bike. It generally has wider tires than a pure road bike, but they won't be as big or as knobby as you find on a mountain bike. The hybrid also has a more upright position. Most often, but not always, they will have flat bars. Sometimes they'll have limited gearing. The one in this picture maybe only have, has six or seven gears. More often they will have add-ons to help you carry luggage, racks, and bags to help run errands or carry work and school items. They're great for riding around town and to use as transportation. This model assumes you'll be riding in regular clothes, so it has a chain guard to help you keep long clothing clean and away from the chain. Next slide. So now we're gonna get into the specialty flavors, your rum raisins, your salty caramel truffles. The gravel bike is an increasingly popular option. It is a road bike that is designed to be ridden on rough roads or gravel roads. As a result, it looks like a road bike, but it has some mountain bike-esque features like wider, knobbier tires and gearing more like a mountain bike for steeper hills. Often, they have a more upright positioning than a pure road bike. Depending on the setup, they can be really versatile bikes used for a wide variety of paved or unpaved riding. Next slide. Touring bikes can be road bikes, mountain bikes, or gravel bikes. What really makes a touring bike a touring bike is the ability to carry bags like you see here. This one has a full suit of bags for taking a long trip. Touring bikes generally are also designed to ride long distances. This bike shown, you see the bars are elevated for a more upright position. This bike also has fenders and knobbier tires for dirt or gravel roads. With the increased carrying capacity, these bikes can be great for transportation and errand riding. Next slide. Of course, if you really want to carry a lot of gears, you can do like Mary and you can get a cargo bike. They're specifically designed to carry heavy loads or people. Nowadays, they are increasingly made with an electric assist option to make carrying those heavy loads even easier. Next slide. If you want to ride, you don't even necessarily need to ride a bike with a saddle. There are bikes for uh, that are designed to be ridden while sitting. So recumbent bikes and trikes are for folks who cannot or do not want to ride a saddle. Some people choose to ride them out of personal preference. 
some out of necessity. On the left, you see a recumbent trike with hand pedals for folks who cannot use foot pedals. Trikes are great options for folks who may have balance issues. Next slide. These days, you can get almost any of the above flavors as an e-bike. So they have e-road bikes, e-mountain bikes, e-gravel bikes, e-cargo bikes. Here, the one on the left is set up as an urban cruiser. On the right, it's more uh, of an urban hybrid. E-bikes really deserve their own webinar. It is a huge topic. I know Heidi will discuss them in a bit more depth when she talks about buying bikes. I'll just say they can be a real game changer in making a greenway ride or a grocery run more approachable and fun. Next slide. Okay, I've gone over some of the flavors of bike, but we can still add some tasty toppings for even more variety. For example, many of the above bike types that I mentioned, you can get as a step through, which we see on the left. This has a lower top too, which makes it easier to get on or off the bike, especially if you're carrying things on your bike. So if you have a lot of weight, if you have bags, make it a little easier to throw your leg over the top bar and get on the bike. Some bikes these days don't even need a chain. On the right, we see a belt drive. Some bikes, especially urban bikes, are now become equipped with belt drives, which eliminate the messy chain and have internal gearing. These belt drives can last a long time with less maintenance and mess than a traditional chain, but they may also require some unique parts. Of course, this is all very general and just scratching the surface. Different types of bikes is a, is a topic we could talk about for hours. Next slide. The great thing about bikes is that they are easy to personalize and you don't need to buy new. This is one of my bikes. I bought it at a local bike co-op. It's a mountain bike but I've added road drop handlebars for my own personal comfort. And I've also added fenders to keep me dry in the rain. Next slide. Of course, there are times when it may make sense to not even use your own bike. Some of the cities around uh, in the Triangle region have bike share, which is another great option. Next slide. Before I hand it off to Heidi, my last slide will focus briefly on bike fit. Again, bike fit is a huge topic that could uh, involve a lot more than what I'm gonna go over here. But a big part of getting any bike is making sure that you are comfortable on it, making sure that it fits you well. Everybody's body is different. These are two of my bikes. The one on the left is a gravel touring bike. The one on the right is that mountain bike that I use as a commuter. Both are very comfortable for me. So what works for me probably doesn't work for you. Speaking of generalities, the most important dimensions are the distance between the saddle and the pedals, shown by that vertic more vertical line, and the distance and angle between the saddles and the handlebars. You can see on my bike on the left, the handlebars are about the same level of my saddle, so it's a bit more upright. You want to have your sa saddle raised high enough that when the pedals are at six o'clock and 12 o'clock, that our knees are slightly bent. And you want your handlebars to be at a place where your elbows are slightly bent as well for more comfort. On most bikes, it is very easy to raise and lower the saddle, move it slightly forward or back. Depending on the bike, it may be easy to raise or lower the handlebars. Most bikes, for a bike stop, certainly it would be even easy to change the distance, bring the bars closer to you or further away. A bike shop or an experienced mechanic can even switch from flat bars to drop bars or vice versa. So the key is when you get a bike, you want to sit on it, make sure the saddle is adjusted correctly, and make sure it's comfortable on your hands, elbows, shoulders, and neck. So now I'll pass it along to Heidi to talk more about the experience of buying bike. Thank you, Tyler. So Tyler has given you a great introduction to bikes and all the types that are out there. And now you've decided that you want to go out and try this wonderful invention. And you've discovered that buying a bike in a pandemic isn't so easy. Um, so how are you going to do that? Um, and like Tyler, I will say that 
any one of my slides I could spend 10 minutes on, but uh, I'm going to have to do them all in about 10 minutes. So we'll get started. Um, at the end of the thing, I think there is a list of our emails. If we don't cover something, please feel free to send me an email and ask a question. Next slide, please. So the first thing I'll say is if you can't find what you're looking for uh, new, or if your budget is low, please consider a used bike. There are so many great used bikes out there. You might not think there are, but if you just wait a few days, a new one will pop up that might be the one you're looking for. Craigslist, eBay, and Nextdoor, uh, and Facebook all can give you a bike that's close to you. You can adjust eBay to tell it to look only within 50 miles or 100 miles of where you live. You can look on Craigslist. You can search the bikes by city. Next door, almost all of those will be close to you. Facebook has virtual yard sales and marketplaces that you can also customize for your area. And there are also used bikes that you can get at bike stores um, and at yard sales. The difference is that these can all be done online um, before you go to see it in person. Next slide, please. Uh, the other place you can look if you really don't have any money to spend, but you really want a bike, is your local co-op where you can actually earn a bike by building your own. Um, and I checked with the Carborough Recyclery, which is actually in Chapel Hill, uh, to see if they had any bikes right now, any frames, any, any parts that they could build up. And they, they said they had a pretty decent inventory. So if you feel like learning how to put a bike together, people will walk you through it. There may also be one in Raleigh, I don't know, maybe Mary can say later, but I know that these are two places where you can earn a bike without putting any money down. Next slide, please. So you've decided you wanna buy a used bike and you see one that looks interesting um, and you're gonna go look at it. What are you looking for? If you have ridden bikes, you will know if this is the bike for you. If you haven't, if you're trying to buy a bike so you can get started, take somebody with you who rides bikes who can test it out for you. So um, is it the right kind of bike for you? Tyler gave you lots of choices depending on what you wanna do with it. Uh, if the bike matches you, make sure it's been taken care of. Look at it to see if it's got a lot of rust on it. Check the chain. If the chain is rusted solid, you do not want that bike. Um, if there's normal wear on the tires and brake pads, it may just mean that the bike has been ridden. Those things can be replaced pretty easily, uh, but you might want to consider that when you're negotiating a price with the person. If the bike has been kept inside a garage and hardly ever ridden, that's a great bike to buy. Usually they buy it thinking they're going to ride and something happens. Uh, check to see if the seat can go up and down. A lot of times there are bikes where the seat post will get seized into the frame and even the bike shops cannot get them out. So uh, make sure you can raise and lower the seat post uh, or else make sure it fits you perfectly before you buy it. Are there dents or cracks in the frame? There are aluminum frames, steel frames and carbon frames. Uh, a steel frame can take a small nick or dent in it without necessarily causing any um, problems with the frame. A carbon frame, which is your higher end frame, could have cracks in it that could be serious problems. So just check around it, make sure there aren't any issues with the frame itself. Then does it fit? Get on the bike, try it out. If you are new to biking and you don't even really feel comfortable riding the bike, that's where your friend comes in. Have them check the gears or you check the gears while you're riding it. Make sure they all shift to where they're supposed to go, the highest and the lowest. Make sure in the lowest gear, you can get up a hill that you want to get up so that uh, the bike has the right gearing for you. Ask when the bike was last uh, serviced. And this is especially true with e-bikes because uh, if, you, if the bike was purchased somewhere else, like online, you want to know if there's a local place that will work on that bike. Uh, and also, you know, the person might say, oh, yeah, I just serviced it myself last week. Well, is that person a professional or did he just squirt some oil on the chain? Uh, and if it's an e-bike, and I'll get into this a little bit later, but ask how the battery was stored and look up the replacement cost of the battery because if the battery has been stored incorrectly, the life of it will probably be greatly compromised and you might be looking at a new battery that costs several hundred dollars. 
And finally, look online and see if that bike is listed somewhere with a review beside it. Just put in the name and the model of the bike and put review. A lot of bikes, even old bikes from the late 90s and early 2000s, sometimes have a review online that tells you that this is a great bike for you. Uh, next slide, please. If you want to go the full new bike, you don't want to have to work on something that needs some work on it, and you want something that's ready to ride, I suggest you start looking locally first, just like with anything. And the reason is because when you buy something local, almost 50% of the money you spent stays in your community. And if you buy something online, almost none of it does. Next slide, please. Some other things you might consider when you're buying a new bike. At the local bike shop, you will have somebody who can work on that bike. You'll have a full-time mechanic who knows that bike, who can um, do the service for you. Sometimes, sometimes the, the early maintenance um, is included in the cost of the bike. Uh, again, as I said, it improves the local economy. You can try out the bike first. Uh, it may cost you a little more. If you buy from a local big box, um, REI does have its own bicycling department, but Target and Walmart, I guarantee you, do not. And the people who put those bikes together are not going to be the same mechanics that you're going to be wanting to use when your bike needs a tune-up. Um, it does keep some money local at the local big box. And some of the stores have lower prices, but often the quality is down as well. Online, you really want to make sure someone local can service your bike. For non-e-bikes, that's not really a big deal. Uh, most mechanics will work on any regular bikes, but e-bikes have their own category. You wanna make sure somebody will work on your e-bike if you buy it online. Uh, e-bikes also, you can't try them out first. Um, if you, I mean, bikes that you buy online. So unless you know somebody locally who bought that same bike online and you can try theirs out, it will be a bit of a risk to know whether it fits you correctly. Um, next slide, please. So how much should you spend? Um, so many people come up to me all the time and say, oh, I've only got $300 I can spend on the bike. And sometimes I believe them and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I think people think that a bike is a toy and therefore you shouldn't spend a lot of money on it. Uh, but I'm just going to tell you my bike and I have lots of bikes, but the one I have bikes in my garage that are 40 years old that I still ride. So a bike will last you a really long time if you take care of it. Uh, if money is truly an option, I mean a factor, as I said earlier, uh, you can look for used, you can look at the bike co-op. If you have $300 to spend, don't buy a new bike with $300. Go buy a much better used bike. You'll get better quality for it. Uh, and remember, you don't pay for insurance, you don't pay for parking, you don't pay for registration on a bike, you don't need a license for a bike. If you ride a bike a lot, you don't need a gym membership. Uh, you can save on fuel for your car. You can help save the planet. And no, this is not just my little spiel. This is all based on studies. While you're saving the planet, you can lower your blood pressure, increase your mental sharpness, overcome depression, lower your risk of heart disease and some kinds of cancers, conquer obesity and more just by pedaling a bike. So when you're thinking about how much you can spend on a bike, don't think of it as a toy. Think of it as a substitute for cars. Cars cost per people an average of $9,000 a year to maintain. So your bike is gonna cost you a fraction of that. Next slide, please. E-bikes. Uh, as Tyler said, e-bikes are a game changer. Um, I have one. I absolutely love it. I know so many people who have gotten bikes, uh, gotten into bikes because they never thought they could keep up. They didn't like getting sweaty on their way to work. Now it's like getting in a convertible. I mean, you've got the air blowing your hair and you can arrive at work without any sweat. Um, but there are so many of them out there. Look online, check out the reviews for all the bikes. If you think you want, a specific type of e-bike that you've heard about, let's say Blix uh, cargo bike, or you want a Aventon. Almost all of the bike manufacturers for online bikes have their own user pages. So if you're on Facebook, join the user group for that bike, and you can learn 
what people like and don't like about the bikes. You can learn which models they like the best. Um, it will just give you an insight into whether or not that's the bike for you. You can ask questions of people who already have those bikes. Um, there are different classes of e-bikes. There are three different classes of e-bikes. Um, two of them have a top speed of 20 miles an hour and class three is 28. In North Carolina currently, they are all considered bicycles. They don't distinguish between the three classes. However, there are states that do distinguish like California. And at some point, North Carolina may as well. If that is a concern to you, like if you think your bike might not be allowed on the American Tobacco Trail, I would suggest you go with either the class one or the class two bikes. Um, and I could spend a whole day talking about e-bikes, but that's all I'm gonna say about them right now. Types of motors, there's a rear hub, there's a front hub, there's a mid drive. They all operate differently. They all have strengths. Um, you just have to, again, do your research, talk to people who have them, ask them what they like and don't like. See how easy it is to charge. You have to plug it in while it's on the bike because if you do, you have to have an outlet either in your garage or somewhere where you can roll the bike into. Or can you remove the battery and take it in with you and charge it inside? Um, we've already talked about places you can buy them locally. Used, I'm very, very cautious on used e-bikes, but um, there are some very uh, reputable online e-bike companies that I would say would be fine to buy from. As long as you can find somebody near you who can service them. If you buy a really cheap e-bike, I will just tell you, there are some places that will not touch it. And it's not necessarily because they don't wanna to touch it. It's either because they don't know anything about that bike and how to fix it, or the bike has been made so poorly that nothing they can do will actually make it work properly. And then they'll be blamed for not making it work. So just be sure you can find somebody who will work on the bike. Um, next slide, please. And if you can only have one bike and you go, ah, oh, I kind of like all of them. I like the road bike, but I like the gravel bike, but I like the city bike. You have to pick one. I would say go with a hybrid, something that's more upright. It gives you a lot more flexibility. Um, and then make it more than just a bike. Add the rack, add the panniers or saddlebags, add a basket, add a trailer. You can suddenly do your whole week's worth of uh, grocery shopping with a bike. You don't need to take your car. If your grocery store is a mile away, why on earth would you want to drive over there when you could hop on your bike and have some exercise at the same time? Um, in general, again, look for a really wide range of gears because we do live in a pretty hilly area and um, look for good quality parts and make sure it fits you well. Next slide, please. Um, this is, these are two of my bikes. So the one at the top is my everyday bike. Um, it has fenders for the rain. It has um, a rack that I can add the basket to when I need to, which is usually every time I go out. Um, I can add panniers to that rack as well, which will extend it even more. And then when I really have a big load, you can see at the bottom, I've added a trailer, which is not a very expensive thing and put a big blue tub on it. I can carry anything in that. Um, and even um, the last one on the bottom is my folding bike. Even on this bike, I can get three bags of groceries on that bike with the pannier in the back and the giant basket in the front. So whatever bike you get, don't think of it as, as just um, going out and having fun with it when you can make it do more for you. Um, next slide, please. I'm sorry, I'm flying through these, but I'm really trying to keep up. Uh, the last thing, Len asked me to talk a little bit about locks, and I really can't cover it in this amount of time, but I did talk to the police one time who were doing this operation to see uh, who cut through what locks, and they told me that it seemed to them that all the locks that cost more than $20 had some sort of a deterrent. If people were looking at the locks, that was sort of the, the place where they became so cheap that anybody could cut through it. Um, U locks are great, uh, the ones made by Kryptonite, but there are other brands now. Abus folding locks are very similar to U locks, but they are uh, they fold up and they fit into the space where your uh, water bottle goes, so they're really easy to carry. Just as important as what kind of lock is how to lock your bike. Be sure you go through the frame. 
If you just go through the front wheel and it has a quick release, you may come back and find only the wheel left and the rest of the bike will be gone. Um, and park it somewhere where it's well-traveled. If I'm parking my bike, if I'm taking the bus from Chapel Hill to Raleigh or something, I lock my bike up in front of a place like the Starbucks because I know that people are gonna be going in and out of there all day long. They probably think I'm in there all day long, but my bike is still there when I get back. I'm not gonna lock it up in some place where there isn't much traffic and where it's easy for someone to come and take it away. Also parking decks with bike locks or bike racks are great because they usually have cameras. And uh, that's all I've got. I've got a lot more, but that's all I'm gonna say. And now I will pass it over to Mary. Hey y'all, wonderful presentations. I think I have about five minutes, so I'm gonna cruise through my slides pretty fast too. Um, so my name is Mary Sal, I work with Oaks and Spokes. Here's a quick slide of some of the folks on our team. Um, I'm the staff member at Oaks and Spokes and Nick is our onboard president. We also have eight other board members that support us. You can do the next slide, Paul. So I was asked to talk a little bit about safety today. Um, certainly a helmet can be a, an important component of safety, um, especially here in the United States where we don't always have the infrastructure to accommodate um, a slow and safe speed at all times. Um, elbow pads, you know, whatever works for you. That's what my son uses right now. He's learning to ride his bike. Um, whatever makes you feel safe. Could you do the next slide, please, Paul? The other thing I wanted to mention is in addition to always wearing your helmet, if that's what makes you feel safe here, is to also advocate for better infrastructure because there are countries that kind of have graduated beyond feeling like everybody needs to wear their helmet or armor when they go out and bike. Next slide, please, Paul. Another thing that's really important with safety, especially if you're gonna be riding at night, is making sure that your um, bike has reflectors on it. So when you purchase it, it will have some embedded reflectors. There are ways you can kind of bedazzle your bike, if you will, and add extra sparkle for when you're out. Um, the second photo down there is just tape that you can add. You can buy that on Amazon or at a local um, bike shop as well. My husband has put that over every component of our bike because if a headlight's on a vehicle catch your um, bike, it, it will light it up very well. Next slide, please, Paul. You also want bike lights. So that's something that you'll pretty consistently see at like a tabling event. And that's a really great um, kind of first bike light to have. Any type of lighting is better than no lighting. Um, cars aren't always expecting a, a bike out in the road and anything you can do to make yourself more visible is always a positive thing. It's suggested, and I'm pretty sure it's North Carolina law now actually, but to have a front and a back light. So that's something that you wanna make sure you have incorporated. Um, so the red light goes in the back. You can usually put it on different settings where it might be able to blink or leave it on if you wanted to add more lights in the future. Sometimes you leave one that's on, one that's blinking, and then the front light as well is um, both for you to see and for others to see you. Paul, you can do the next slide. I also wanted to provide a little bit of a vantage on kind of a good, better, best for a front and a back light. I'm super happy to send people, you know, links after the presentation because um, this doesn't have the specific brand, but you can kind of see the general um, price range that you might be looking at. So for $20, you can invest in a really good front light um, and you can go all the way up to like an $80 light, which is like, if you're really pretty serious about it, maybe if you're riding in a spot where it's it's quite dark at night and it doesn't have a lot of um, light street lighting, um, that could be a really great addition as you bike more. Next slide, please, Paul. And you have the same, right, for your backlights. Um, the backlights, you, and the other thing I want to mention is um, a lot of times at, at events, you might get out where people are supporting biking, you might get um, a light that probably, you know, would be even a little bit less than these. Those would work great too. And I would encourage you anytime um, you had any light is better than no light. <laughs> um, and please do add those. They'll just be a little bit less bright. And sometimes they don't have the ability to recharge, which is really handy because um, you have to get batteries and that can be kind of clunky. So a lot of these um, in the good, better, best range might have like a USB charger where you can really easily plug them in at home and charge them overnight. Um, so that keeps them as a part of your bike for, for a very long time. So again, you kind of have a price range here where you could go anywhere from 10 to 50 to have a good, better, best option. Next slide, please, Paul. 
And the, the last step, you know, is there are a lot of different ways that you can enhance your safety through choosing different routes. And I think Google Maps is a wonderful place to start. I would encourage you um, to either, you know, drive the route if it's your first time and you're not, you're not comfortable riding um, to check it out and see if it would be you know, with you, you would feel safe. Biking, you can also do Google Street View, where you can pull it up and get like a real-time glimpse of if it's a really wide corridor and you might not feel safe going on there. Sometimes Google, in all honesty, I feel puts you in spots that I wouldn't personally be safe riding, and maybe I'm a little bit more of a middle-of-the-road biker, but you can modify your ride a little bit um, by dragging it around. There's also a little bike icon that you can see here that you can select, so you would want to select that over a car, a bus, or a walking option because it might route you on a greenway or other ways that um, it would be set up for biking. Um, also with safety, it's important to let the drivers know what you are going to be doing. Um, one thing I would suggest <laughs> so many rides a lot is, is do make eye contact with the driver. Um, you really can assume that they see you, unfortunately, and sometimes they are distracted. Um, so look, you know, make sure that you see them um, because they don't always see you. And I would encourage caution as much as you can um, in the sense of you know, don't, don't put yourself out there and not be aware of your surroundings, just like a driver obviously should be just as aware. Um, also, I was asked to talk a little bit about like infrastructure. Um, so if you see a Shero on the road, um, which you see in the upper left-hand corner, that would be something that would indicate that's where the bike physically could go. And a lot of times those are more in the middle of a road and that is actually indicating that's where your bike should be. Because if you're a little bit too far over to the right, which I know sometimes I would probably have a tendency to hug the curb more because I would feel safer initially there, you actually should be more in the middle of the road because the cars are you're more visible to the vehicles there. So um, I think that's the main things. Oh, and the other thing is hand signals. I mean, there are like technical ways that you can um, use the, the right and the left hand to, to show a driver to turn. I kind of just use my hand to wave in the direction that I'm going because I think that's a little bit more intuitive to the vehicle. Um, but there are like, if you take a bike safety training course, there are specific ways that you can signal right and left. I don't know if all cars are familiar with that, but I think waving in the general direction that you're going if you're turning is helpful. Paul, could you go to the next slide? Really briefly, I did want to mention that we have a ton of bike month activities as well with Oaks and Spokes. Um, one actually is an electric bike um, event where people can come and test ride electric bikes because a lot of times those are online. And I think we have 14 different bikes that are signed up. So if you're in the Raleigh area and you might be interested in that, that's something you can join in on. Paul, you can go to the next slide, which I think is just the final one, giving my contact information. Yeah, so if you need to get a hold of us, this is how you do it. And I think that's also on the last slide. Thanks, Paul. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Mary. And um, I believe that we are now at our question and answer portion. We've had a, um, a robust chat going on, so several questions have been answered along the way. Um, I know that, let's see, there was a question from Sharwanda at the beginning and um, asked about if cargo bikes will fit on the city bus bike rack for people who aren't aware. Um, most buses in the triangle, if not all of them, are equipped to hold up to two bikes on the front of the bus rack. And would any of our panelists like to weigh in on that question? Uh, I can give a general answer and Mary might have more personal experience riding a cargo bike. Um, it may depend on the model. Uh, I do know that cargo bikes generally are designed to be a little bit longer um, to make space for that cargo capacity. And as such, they might not fit within the standard dimensions that the bus is set up for. Uh, another thing to think about would also just be the weight. Uh, cargo bikes are generally heavier, especially if you have a lot of things on them, so it may be difficult to lift into the bike rack. Yeah, I would just say briefly, like I have a, like a bucket cargo bike, which is like a really like copious style like big bucket on the front that definitely and then the long tails that Tyler was mentioning um one thing if, if you live near like your bus depot um where they park the buses for a minute you could always try like seeing if it works um if you have one or, or I wanted to check it out but it is pretty heavy as well yeah um I would like to add there are um there's a place where you can practice on Franklin Street in Chapel Hill and I believe 
I'm blanking on where the other one is, but on Franklin Street, there's a bike fix it station as well as a place where you can practice putting it on the bus rack. Yeah, it's in the mid block of uh, Franklin Street. Thank and you. I know that my long tail did not fit on the bike rack um, when I had it. I also, though, when I got my folding bike, wanted to see if that fit on there. And I did go down to Chapel Hill and tested it first, and it fit great. So that was, that was good to find out. Awesome. Let's see here. Going through my list. Um, Trawanda also asked about um, how uh, Tyler got the bike from the bike co-op. Um, if you wanted to talk about your experience with the bike co-op, that would be great. Uh, yes, and I think uh, Heidi mentioned that there are a, a bunch of great local co-ops, and, and they may all work a, a little differently. Um, I worked for one, um, which is where I, I found the bike. So I bought it as a bike, you know, that they had for sale. Um, and it may be the same way uh, at the local co-ops where they sort of act as a, a store where they have models that are ready for sale. Um, but you may want to call ahead to see what sort of available that they have just because um, there's such a crunch for, for bikes right at the moment. Um, but they're very, uh, I've always had very positive experiences with my local co ops. Great. Let's see. Um, any recommendations on um, how to find bike trails in the Wake County Triangle area that can be downloaded to an iPhone? Yeah, I saw the inquiry about that app. I can certainly follow up on that. I'm, I know of maps that are electronic, um, but I don't know if there is an app that would like automatically sync with your phone if you were trying to do like turn by turn directions. Gotcha. Oh, yeah, um, we had a Triangle Trails um, webinar last week. Um, if you wanted to check that out, it's on Go Triangle site on their Mission Impossible um, section. But um, Sig Hutchinson talked to us about trails and he mentioned an app called Green Space. And I think that we're going to be putting all of these resources together and, and sharing them on the Go Triangle Bike Month page. So, um, but yeah, again, that was green space and Kim Johnson shared that in the chat. Oh, awesome. Let's see. Um, somebody asked- uh, I have a question for Heidi. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Lynn. Heidi, where do we find the model number of a bicycle? So brands are all different and they all put them in different places. But I think Tyler answered that. Usually it's on, if it's a diamond frame, it's on the top tube. Um, you know, first you find the brand name, right? So the brand is like Specialized or Cannondale or something. And then you just look for the other word that's on the frame that isn't the brand. And that will be your your model number. Sometimes it's a number like a T seven hundred. Um, so just look on the frame; it's on there somewhere. Yeah, we we had another question about the bike racks on the buses, and uh, please, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that they are all the the same size. Um, so yeah, if you try one, then you should be good on on all of them. Um. There was a question that came in the chat. I'm not sure it went out to everyone. Um, for the folks in Wake County, uh, what are some recommendations for taking a beginner's bike uh, cycling class or biking class? For taking a cycling class, like yeah. to learn how to ride? Or more about, I just um, think for someone who's a beginner, you know, like I know that they get traffic bicycles off of the traffic skills yeah. or something similar. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, we, we definitely have like league instructed courses and classes that happen um, from time to time, which might be more of an intermediate, um, you know, skill set. Also, REI hosts um, classes for folks that might just be learning to ride. Um, and that is another good local resource. Those are the two that I'm most familiar with. I don't know if anybody else from um, Lake County has thought.
Also, in the Chapel Hill Carver area, there are a number of bicycle stores that have um, regular rides every week or month, and it encourages people to check out various types of bicycles, as well as some instruction on how to just do basic riding, and then they'll do the community rides. So check out um, Chapel Hill only and Carver only have three or four stores, so check those out. Yeah, yeah, I should just add real quick, like slow rolls are really fun ways to um, like be in a big social group so you could feel super safe, like, you know, someone's 50 to 100 people um, where you're all kind of riding in the streets together. So that can help people that might want to ride bikes, but not feel as comfortable riding by themselves, get more comfortable. And like Raleigh has like every Wednesday night, Crank Arm does a social ride. Um, so that's super popular and usually has like 75 folks. So it's a big group of people. See, I'm going through my questions again, see if I missed any. Oh yeah, it's a great one. Is there a way to register your bike with the local police department or a way to mark your bike to prove it belongs to you, especially if it's used? I would, um, most probably, I know at, at, at Duke, the, the police uh, register bikes. Um, you'll you'll want to mark down the serial number for sure. and write down your bike's serial number. Um, which it, it can be not standardized, unfortunately, where it is. It's generally at the very bottom of the bike, right in the, what's called the bottom bracket, which is connects the, the pedals together. Um, but uh, at, the, at the absolute minimum, I would recommend writing that or see it in the spot where you can get rid of it, but hiding you could probably add an additional. Fantastic. I know there was um, a question about um, for bike month and handing out lights in Wake County. And I'm going to put the um, the Raleigh bike month link in there. If you haven't checked that already, I would recommend that. Um, also, the Go Triangle um, bike month page has keep scrolling past the place where you RSVP for this. Um, there are events and rides near you based on location. So I'm just going to throw that in there as well. Um, also, I'm going to plug my event in Hillsboro. If um, we're going to have the clean machine out, and they're going to have, they're going to bring a couple bikes that you can actually um, demo and sort of see if you haven't been on a bike for years, like myself. I'm really looking forward to that, and that's happening um, next Wednesday at Riverwalk in Hillsboro, and I'm going to have bike uh, bike lights there. Also, go Chapel Hill. If you email go ch at townofchapelhill.org. Can get you bike lights and the town of Carborough, Zach Hallett, also bicycle lights, no charge. Right. And regarding yeah. registration, the regarding university of uh, regarding bike registration, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill also does bike registration. Um, so that in fact they really hope that students will do that in order to um, keep up with bicycles in case something happens to them and then they're found like Let's see, and so we also got a couple questions in from people registering. So um, again, be, be paying attention to the chat because there's some good information being shared there. But let's see, let me look there. Is a hybrid bike any easier on potential back strain than a mountain bike? Any comments, any insights on that? I would say that I think uh, like ergonomic is, yeah. I was just gonna say it, it partly depends on what kind of riding you're doing uh, with the bikes and partly on whether the bike is fitting you correctly. No bike should really cause your back to hurt if you've got the right bike. <laughs> so, all right. If there's some pain, you need to make some adjustments. Um, uh, and there are great stretches you can find for like your shoulders after you've ridden to sort of, you know, stretch out the areas so that you don't ache later. And a lot of times people who ride bikes will sort of hunch up like this with their shoulders up high. And, and you really want to keep your shoulders relaxed so that you aren't you aren't doing that. So part of it is probably just the way you ride, but um, you shouldn't be having back pain. 
That is not a part of the deal. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see, I got another question in the RSVPs about, um, would you recommend or are, are you aware of any resources or guides on basic bike maintenance? Not really tune-ups, but just what people should check on their bikes before, before riding. The Go Chapel Hill website has a bike month tab, and we have um, 17 videos regarding all kinds of topics, including a basic bike maintenance um, check, as well as some basic tune-up tips. All right, I'll put that link in the chat, Lynn, thanks. Also, and Tyler would probably say this too, but bikeleague.org, which is the League of American Bicyclists, has some excellent videos um, about doing what they call the ABC quick check, which is the check you want to do on your bike before you ever take it out on the road, before each ride, just to make sure you've got air in the tires, the brakes work, et cetera. Um, but bikeleague.org has a wealth of information, learning how to ride, riding on the road, all that. And Brandy, there's also um, a video on the Go Triangle um, website um, with the ABC um, bike check information on it and like how to secure your helmet and make sure your helmet fits correctly as well. Awesome. Kim, doesn't the Go Triangle website also have a how to load your bike on bus um, yes. video? I know the Go Chapel Hill website does as well. Yes. In case you don't aren't able to get to one of the um, practice stations. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I was just going to try to get the link, but I guess we'll send that later. Oh, thanks for that link, Paul, for the bike lead. Let's see here. Oh, we didn't, I don't know if, did we, I think we might have touched briefly on this, but this is just something that's always kind of puzzled me. Is that what's the difference between women's and men's bikes? A lot of times the size. <laughs> So, you know, sometimes when they say women's bikes, what they really mean is step through frames, but there are women specific frames. They tend to have um, a slightly shorter uh, distance between the handlebars and the seat because women tend to have shorter forearms. Um, sometimes the handlebars are narrower because women's shoulders are narrower. So there are some things that adjust them, but, you know, we're talking fine wines as opposed to red and white. Uh, you can, you can ride. I I have bikes that are women specific, and I have bikes that are for anybody, or or specifically not women specific, and they all fit me. It's all in how they fit you. So yeah. In, in, in some cases, it may be as much uh, a difference in marketing and paint scheme as, as anything. I think it's more it's more pronounced in road bikes because. Uh, that's where people are really looking for every advantage they can get usually. And sometimes it'll be like the brake levers aren't as far out. You've got shorter fingers, so they have shorter brake levers, so it's easier. But those are mostly all on drop bars, wouldn't you say, Tyler? I don't think of that as being something you find on hybrid bikes or, or city bikes very much. Agreed. Even with mountain bikes, I know that there are, I've only ever heard of fewer women-specific options for even mountain bikes than there are for a road bike. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so we've got just a couple more minutes left, and then we've got one more speaker that we want to talk to. Um, but let's see, there's one question. I think it's a great one, and I'd like to hear from you. Did, how do you think we can convince employers to take advantage of tax credits and other support for bike purchases and maintenance? Any ideas about that? Well, <laughs> um, the average cost of a parking space, I think, is something like between twenty and thirty thousand dollars. So, it seems to me that you would want to encourage as many people as you could to get to work without a car, so that you weren't spending all that money on 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 concrete. Um, also, uh, in my magic pill slide, I didn't mention this, but uh, people who bike to work are 40% less likely to take sick days as people who don't um, because they're healthier. So uh, why not give them an incentive 
you know, somebody I know once said that they got free parking where she worked and she commuted by bike and all these other people were getting free parking. And when she got there and they were announcing this, they said, but because you don't drive, we're just going to give you a raise. All right. Well, that might get somebody's attention. <laughs> that <can be> <laughs> So really just sort of being an advocate in your organization and speaking out about the things that you need and letting them know that there's a need. That's all. All right. So we are nearing the end of our hour that we've uh, blocked for this time. And we've got one more person that we want to introduce you to. And again, we also have um, a survey. So please stick around to the very end. But um, we'd like to hear from Itza Salazar. Itza learned how to bike at a very young age and has enjoyed it ever since. She started off biking in her neighborhood and then joined a youth cycling program in high school where she biked across the country. After graduating from the program, she began to volunteer with them and is their program manager. So happy to hear from you. It's are you there? Hello. Yes, I'm here. Thank you, everyone. And I'm happy to see how many people could join us today. Um, so like Brandy said, my name is Itza Salazar and I'm the program manager with Triangle Bike Works. It's a local nonprofit youth development organization. Our mission is to strengthen the power of youth who are Black, Latina, Asian, Indigenous, and people of color to overcome challenges, achieve audacious goals, and discover their true selves. So I've been a part of this organization since the start in 2010 as one of the youth cyclists. This was when I found my bike community. I learned how to bike when I was three years old. My dad taught me and my siblings, and we would ride in our neighborhood um, then and eventually started exploring the adjacent neighborhoods. At some point, my siblings stopped wanting to ride with me and riding alone wasn't fun anymore. Luckily, when I was in high school, I was invited to be a part of a pilot program called Spoken Revolutions. They promised to teach me um, how to handle my bike better um, and train me so I could complete a 60 mile bike ride. By that spring, um, uh, by that spring, and then um, they gave us the bike gear, the bikes, anything we really needed. Um, the interesting thing was we received mountain bikes. Um, they had knobby tires and they were really, really heavy. Um, and sadly, we were only able to do two training rides uh, that were about 10 miles long just because we got rained out before that spring ride. Needless to say, everything still went well and we completed a 60 mile bike ride at the North Carolina spring ride in 2010. That was the hardest 60 miles I had ever done in my life. And that had been the furthest I had ever biked. As much as I remember the pain, I really remember more how much fun I was having and just the bike community in general. That trip sparked something in me and my fellow teammates. When we regrouped, uh, we wanted more. We enjoyed that spring ride so much that we were like, what else can we do? We were handed different bike maps and we were, we were told, which one of these do you wanna go on? And one stuck out to us. It was the Underground Railroad. It was a map starting in Mobile, Alabama and finishing in Niagara Falls, New York. So in 2011, when I was just a junior in high school, along with nine other of my fellow teammates, we traveled 1800 miles in 30 days. Yeah, that's 60 miles a day. I fell in love with Triangle Bike Works um, with the program Spoken Revolutions because we traveled, we learned about untold history, the environment, land and water conservation, and just seeing the world from the, bike, from the back seat of a bike really changed my life. Since then, I've been on seven bike tours following various historic routes. I love road cycling and coaching the youth that join our program, and I'm happy to announce that I'm now a mountain biker. That journey was something else, and that's another story for another day. But as I share my story, I want to know, I want you to know that there are so many different styles of cycling. We've, I told you about road cycling, there's mountain biking, we heard about commuting, bike touring, cycle across, and there's many, many more. Along with the different styles of cycling, there are so many groups and organizations in the Triangle area. I found my home at Triangle Bike Works. And if you'd like to hear more about us and other cycling communities in the area, join us at the next webinar in the fall, Finding Your Bike Community.
Um, so I just want to say thank you again for coming out and letting me share a little bit about me and my journey with Triangle Bike Works. And like I said, keep an eye out for the Finding Your Bike Community webinar in the fall. Thank you so much. It's, a, um, it's always great to hear from you. And um, I know that I'm looking forward to the webinar in the fall and, and I hope that you are too. And with that, that's our time. So I'd just like to thank all our presenters and our attendees and remind everyone that we've got a survey and we're doing a bike month goodie bag. So go ahead and fill that out and let us know what else you'd like to hear from us. And again, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to learn more about how to find your right bike. And we're so glad that you spent some of your time with us today. Thanks and have a great rest of the National Bike Month.